What does it mean to be a word-centered missionary? And Aaron Judson had invested himself so much in this written word so that as he started to suffer, people wondered why he stayed. What broke through in this Buddhist worldview was they saw this white man from the Americas come over and suffer for the sake of this translation project. And for the first time, they see a religious man denying himself for the sake of loving his neighbor. And there was something otherworldly about his self-denial that stood out to them. Missionary and author E.D. Burns with some gut-punching truths drawn from the life and example of Adoniram Judson coming up in one minute. But first, a word from ABWE President Paul Davis. ABWE missionaries are coming beside the lost and the hurting around the world. And through the Global Gospel Fund, they're pulling people from the darkness and training them as leaders. They're planting churches, and they're even beginning their own missions movements. You may already support one ABWE missionary. Would you consider a gift to the Global Gospel Fund to support all 1,000 of our missionaries? Thank you for that. Become a partner today at abwe.org slash global gospel fund. Welcome to the Missions Podcast, the show that explores your hard questions on missions, theology, and practice to help goers think and thinkers go. I'm Alex Kochman, Director of Advancement and Communications for ABWE International, joined again, as always, by our co-host, Scott Dunford, West Coast Advancement Coordinator for ABWE. See, Scott, both of our titles are changing a little bit. You know, it's just, we're very fluid around here, right? It's sort of the yeah. nonprofit world and, and everybody wears a bunch of different hats. Is that is that accurate? You know what, I've, I've learned whatever whatever makes our bosses happy. And uh, in this case, it's you, Alex. So <laughs> I was your boss, now you're my boss. So hey, whatever you want to call me is fine. As the, long as we get to do this show. That's right. The, the Padawan has become the Jedi. Um, anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Something like that. So um, Scott, I love love um, feeling convicted and awful about myself. <clears throat> and so, you know, and so, you know what I did today? <laughs> oh, yes. A, a good, you know, black coffee drinking, drag your face through the gravel type of Calvinist. And so um, in that interest, uh, in that vein, I was listening to a Paul Washer sermon earlier today, which again, is a great recipe to feel convicted and overwhelmed with your inadequacies. Um, now, I'm not sure if any of our listeners have heard Paul Washer's message from the G3 conference in 2019. Um, and he talks about the qualifications for a missionary and, you know, he gets it. There's so much pragmatism, right? And we talk about this on the show all the time. There's so much pragmatism in the church, whereas scripture puts forward for us a picture of a missionary as someone who meets the qualifications of an elder described in the Pauline epistles in, in first Timothy and Titus and elsewhere. Somebody who's driven by a love for the word, somebody who's steeped in the ministry of the word and prayer. You know, to use that phrase that's in Acts chapter six. Um, I got to ask you before we dive into this a little bit more, you know, for you when you were in Asia and I'm sure there was times you were burdened, stressed out. Was it scripture? Was it the word that, that kept you going? You know, I, I imagine you had an experience where you kind of got to the end of where all the, the practicalities, the strategies, you know, all of the stuff, all of the fluff of missions really doesn't sustain you anymore. And you are just face to face with God and you have prayer and you have the word and not a lot else. I mean, am I wrong in that? <laughs> you, well, yeah, I, my, my quick spiritual answer is yes, of course, Alex. You know, I mean, some some days it just feels like <laughs> and I don't want to just limit it to to the overseas these missions, but, but here doing ministry and pastoral ministry, sometimes it's just like, I don't want to be embarrassed that I quit, <laughs> you know, like, uh, I need a paycheck. Um, but at the end of the day, uh, what is going to sustain us in, in ministry and keep us not just like doing the function of ministry, um, has to be that deep communion with God. And that comes from knowing him. And there were many, many times when, you know, the biography of God that we had built from scripture, but also that scripture being lived out in our lives and the evidence of that in our lives is what kept you just taking the next step by faith. And, um, and 
so so I, I think it, that very much relates into what we're talking about today. Yeah, we, we want to get deeper into what does it mean to be a missionary or pastor, whoever you are, whatever role of ministry, but specifically a missionary driven by the word. And I'm excited to introduce E.D. Burns. Now, E.D. Burns, uh, if you follow the ABWE blog, if you follow websites like Founders Ministries, uh, you'll find that he's written a lot more lately and increasingly writing more and more uh, on the topic of missions. Uh, he wrote The Missionary Theologian. He also wrote A Supreme Desire to Please Him, The Spirituality of Adoniram Judson. We're going to get into that today. Uh, but when I've spoken with E.D. Burns, it's funny how we first got introduced. Um, a friend of mine sent over some manuscripts that you had uh, been working on and submitting to their website and said, hey, what do you think of this? Sent it to, to me um, as well as another person that I think some of our Listeners will be familiar with Chad Vegas from Radius International, and um, both of us, both Chad and I, uh, read what you'd written, and we're like, "Holy moly!" This it, you ever read something and you wish you'd written it because it just so <laughs> accurately, um, yeah, it's, it's exactly what you wanted to write. And that was our experience in, in reading some of your articles. You've got some great stuff on, you know, what are the qualifications of a missionary? What is a true missionary call? And it's doing what we're trying to do on this show, which is bridge the worlds of theology uh, and missionary practice and make sure that those worlds are conversant with each other. Uh, but E.D. Burns, uh, Ph.D., uh, has been a missionary in the Middle East, East Asia, Alaska, interestingly enough, maybe you'll get into that more, and currently Southeast Asia, where he develops theological resources and trains indigenous pastors and missionaries. And from his international location, he also directs the MA in Global Leadership Program at Western Seminary. So tell me about yourself. What did I miss there in that lengthy introduction? Oh, by the way, one other note for our listeners. If anyone, I'm sorry, guys, but if anyone remembers a few weeks ago, I shared this crazy story about my laptop falling off my car at 65 miles an hour while I was on the phone. I was on the phone with E.D. Burns while that wow. was happening. That was my first conversation with him was when my laptop was flying off my roof. He watched me, you know, in real time, pull off to the side of the road. It was a mess. Anyway, E.D., thank you for He's being the only with one us. that's heard Alex swear. No, I was going to say, I can no, validate not. that Alex did not custom swear too much. <laughs> it's because I was on the phone. <laughs> no, it's your, your next book can be on the spirituality of Alex Coke. Never mind. Don't write that book. Don't write that book. No, I'm glad to be here. Love your podcast. And uh, yeah, just thrilled to be able to talk about the word about Judson and what really matters for missions. Very good. So diving into this, you know, topic, and, and especially as we look at missionaries of the past, you know, we, we, we see in our own life, you know, just the fickleness of like, wow, things got hard and I need to quit or, or just that tendency. But then you look in the past and see like these missionary giants. And when I think of like the missionaries that I grew up hearing about, it was William Carey, David Livingston, and of course, Adoniram Judson, um, these are the ones that were kind of put out to us and, and their, their, their families, especially with Adoniram Judson and, and I, Adoniram is hard to say that. It is. Um, maybe you can tell if he, has, is he, if he has a nickname, but so the book starts out talking, first of all, not about the Judsons, although at the end you kind of use them to kind of embody how they embodied some of these ideas, but what is a missionary theologian and why do you think that it's so essential that every missionary should be one? Well, I think the, uh, corresponding alternative to a missionary theologian is what has been popularly talked about as the pastor theologian. And I think one thing that has happened is in our need for speed and our desire to get as many bleeding hearts and warm bodies to the mission field as soon as possible out of good intentions, seeing that there are billions of people plunging into hell. Um, we, we want to send as many as possible, but we don't slow down and ask, whom should we send and what are their qualifications? And it seems to me that the qualifications of an elder or at least a deacon should be the same for a missionary. Um, and so a missionary theologian is not necessarily somebody who has terminal degrees in theology, though that wouldn't be bad, but I think it's somebody who is essentially competent to teach the word or mighty in the scriptures, as the old KJV might say. Um, somebody who bleeds Bible and is motivated by 
word and is driven and sustained by the word. So what is it about Anne and Adoniram Judson? And first of all, introduce our audience to these historic missionaries if they're not overly familiar. I don't think we do a good enough job educating our churches and congregants on historic missionary figures. But why is it that the Judsons to you stand out as examples of word-driven missionary theologians? Give us an overview of them. Yeah, so just briefly, they were the first American missionaries to Burma. Uh, 17th, 18th century, Judson's born in 1788, and uh, they, he, he died in 1850. And when you look at the, the general life of the Judson's, and we'll just take Adoniram specifically, from the very beginning, he was motivated by the word of God to the mission field. Even his call to missions was from the word. And as he sails over to India initially, he converts from Congregationalist to Baptist on the boat because he was doing his own translation from the Greek into English, and he stumbled upon the word for baptism, and his convictions changed. And from the very beginning, he was loyal to the word, even if it meant losing support, losing friends, because to be a Baptist in those days was was um, not necessarily a step up in the Christian celebrity world. Mm. It was actually a big demotion. They're called dirty Baptists, and uh, it was it was not it was not a wise thing if he's concerned about support primarily. Mm-hmm. And at the life of two people who, from the very beginning, moving over to Asia, they are they are devoted to the Word of God, and that is the that is what sustained them throughout all of their sufferings and all of their struggles with it kept coming back to the promises of God in the mm. written word they stand out because they, they testify to the power of the word. It's, there, there's such a fascinating story and you know, it's interesting too. Um, you don't really get into this in this book. You may, maybe in the other one, I haven't read it yet. So I'm kind of excited about picking that up because Adoniram Judson captures my imagination for sure. But like he had a radical conversion story being raised in a Christian home and rejecting truth and a, kind of embracing, you know, kind of an anti-Christian stance and then radically saved. Um, and then the fact of today, I mean, just, just last Sunday, uh, you know, I was in a small Baptist church visiting and there was a Burmese Christian there. And it seems like wherever you go, uh, in the States, you find these, these, you know, these spiritual descendants of Ann and Adoniram Judson, of, of Burmese Christians, particularly Burmese Baptists, um, all over the world, um, but in the book, you specifically bring out Anne. So I've always heard about Anne. Her name was familiar to me, but but mostly as you know, a, an early you know she she died very quickly in her in her ministry, and it's kind of an example of sacrifice. But you you highlight her um, along with her husband, um, and I want to just ask you what what was so unique about her ministry, and how does she? Uh, how did she help along with her husband to kind of form some of these ideas of, of what it would mean to be a, a word centered missionary theologian? Yeah. So her, her story is interesting. And I, of course I highlighted her over and against Sarah and Emily Justin's other two wives later on in life, not because of their insignificance, but because Anne wrote so much. And the unique hmm. thing about both Anne and Adnaram is they both believed in the power of the written word from the very beginning. And uh, they, they would give themselves to writing, to um, translating, to developing theological resources. And what's interesting is, I mean, Anne was brilliant. She really was. And she was such a phenomenal helper to him. He was, he was kind of the classic right-brained studier. You know, he was the student. And she was the classic left-brained sort of hmm. um, just she had such a warm happy way about her that was very welcoming to people and her linguistic style was relational and his linguistic style was was um academic and she developed the catechism and in actually in thai and then it was translated into burmese and uh, wow yeah she she had multiple languages she was operating in in a very short span of time and she was just all in with him and you know the the crisis of missionary bi- biography as we read it from a 21st century egalitarian American standpoint. And, you know, people say, well, look, look at how neglectful so-and-so was of his wife because she suffered and died. Well, you know, she, she wanted to be there, especially specifically, and she wanted to be there 
equally as much as Ad Narum, and they had a different view on reality and on living, and they believed in the uncertainty of life, and they weren't mm-hmm. expecting to live a full, fulfilled out life of 70, 80 years. They were hoping to make it to 30 or to mm-hmm. 40. It's incredible, isn't it? <laughs> oh man, I, we, we could go deeper on that and let's go deeper on that. But I, I, I want to also talk about this aspect of both of them as theologian missionaries, missionary theologians. So, you know, for you, why is it so important that theology come before your method, your methodology? And you know, I, I think we'd all agree that, that what we see is that these days we believe that methods are just neutral. Um, rather than that there's a specific method or, or apostolic uh, methodology or methodologies that, that flow out of the, the word itself. Um, so is that just a contemporary problem or is that something that they felt too? Well, they were certainly up against, you know, pragmatism in its own way and form back then. And they there was even uh, certain missions methods that they knew of that we would call orality today. And I'm, I'm good friends with a lot of guys in the orality movement. And so anything mm-hmm. I say on this is they would actually agree with me. It's just not, you know, it's not widely understood, but both the Judsons understood that you can lead evangelism with orality methods, but you got to eventually root it in written word. And mm-hmm. they, they, they knew that um, sometimes literacy translation and discipleship all go hand in glove together. It's, it's part of the package deal. And they believed, and Judson was, Ad Norm was very explicit about this, that uh, to the degree that you leave the written word in a culture, to that degree, do, do you leave the possibility for long lasting discipleship and church growth to happen? Mm. And so we look at the, the, the philosophy of methods today, um, you know, you, you look at these mission statements of these big hearted mission organizations about things they want to change in a culture, how they want to help people in these various ways, which are all noble in and of themselves. But you can stand back and kind of diagnose the problem they're trying to solve by looking at the solutions. So if the solution is, well, we want to we want to help, um, you know, creation care or or trafficking issues, which are all f- fine in and of themselves. There's nothing wrong with with digging wells in in doing something that actually legitimately help suffering people. Yeah. If that's if that's the solution they're offering on the front end of their mission statement, well the, the solution is answering a problem. And then mm. um, whether it's said or not, it doesn't mean that deep down inside they believe this, but they're operating like they do. It's the problem is is that um, maybe sin makes people sick or it makes them weak. And so Jesus is there to heal them or Jesus is there to help them. But the problem truly is, is that we are damned in Adam and we are dead in sins and trespasses and we need to be made alive in Christ. And there's only one solution to that. And that's the gospel of Christ in the written word. And so this is why we have to be theological, at least in in. Mm motivations and in our methods because what you win them with is what you win them to and what you mobilize them with is what you mobilize them to Mm. one of my favorite books that i'd like to give to to aspiring missionaries going to asia is moffat's got a two two volume work on the history of christianity in asia i'm you've probably seen it um and he doesn't go so much into that particular issue as, as the fact that it's there. And but what, what, one of the things that's so, so striking to me is as you go through the history of how Christianity spread throughout Asia, which isn't something we talk about a lot, but the places where the gospel was, the Bible was translated and scriptures were left in the local language, um, the places where those that written word was left behind are the places where the gospel took and spread and continued to grow. And then places like Arabia in which had lots of Christian tribes, um, were quickly, uh, fell away. Um, once Islam, you know, stuck its head up because they didn't have the word in in their own language. And so I, I love that you bring that up and it's just a good reminder to us of how important the word is, you know, just to back that up, Scott, the staying power of missions is with the written word. Um, and not just the written word, but also the word preached and man, it's not, it's not popular to refer to that at all these days. We, we much more want to build relationships. The idea of preaching, proclaiming uh, is not always popular. Uh, maybe there's reasons we shy away from that, but we need to talk through that. And I think ED can help us do that. We're going to dive into that topic when we return with ED Burns. 
Hi, I'm Scott Dunford, and I'd like to share with you about a new nonprofit ministry established to help churches, Christian schools, and other ministries protect children and prevent abuse. Rich Hamar from Church Law and Tax states that the number one reason that drives churches to court is child sexual abuse. I can't think of anything more devastating to these lives, their families, and our witness before a watching world than sexual abuse that takes place in ministry. The traumatic impact often leaves the vulnerable not wanting anything to do with God or his people. Our efforts toward evangelism, discipleship, and spiritual spiritual formation are not only neutralized, but shattered. Evangelical Council for Abuse Prevention was formed to help ministry leaders understand the complexities of child protection and abuse prevention. They are establishing standards and an accreditation program that will help verify that appropriate measures are in place at your church or ministry. Learn more about them. Find a helpful and free assessment tool to help you see how you measure up in this area. Go to abuseprevention.org and click on the link for this resource assessment. Evangelical Council for Abuse Prevention. And this June, attend the National Conference. Go to abuseprevention.org and register with ABWE21 as the promo code to receive 20% off your ticket. That's promo code ABWE21 to receive 20% off. Brooks Buser, president of Radius International. I am here with Mark Dever, senior pastor at Capitol Hill Baptist and president of Nine Marks. When you go to a culture that's a different language than yours, you're ending up in a kind of majority language that's been reached and there are other people still more hidden, and it's those people who are often almost entirely unreached, and they take more cross-cultural effort. Is there a way we can better train people to have more realistic expectations of what life is like in the kind of two steps away from my culture, and be able to sustain family life with its normal difficulties there, so that there can be a long years and even decades long witness in that culture. And it seems like Radius is set up to provide that training. Radius is about reaching unreached people groups. Go to radiusinternational.org, radiusinternational.org. And we're back with E.D. Burns talking about what it means to be a word-driven missionary today, specifically narrowing in on the life of Adoniram and Ann Judson. And so, E.D., what, why is it that when it comes to proclamational evangelism, so it, yes, we should build relationships, we should build inroads into a community, but there becomes there comes this time when you cross a threshold of pain, of discomfort, where you have to call for repentance and faith and proclaim this message, this news, this announcement about Jesus, right? And that's usually what it it seems like we have the hardest time doing is proclaiming is this conversionary approach to evangelism where we're expecting somebody, okay, you're either going to embrace Christ as Savior and Lord or not. So why is that so difficult for us, not just here at home, but in the missions world too? You would think that missionaries would have that mastered. Well, I, I think, uh, again, this kind of comes down to the definition of terms and presuppositions on what that looks like. And I think the presupposition or the perception, I suppose, is that proclamation evangelism is street preaching. And that certainly includes street preaching, but it doesn't, it's not specifically relegated to street preaching. And I think people have a very uh, hesitant approach to, you know, sharing the gospel the gospel is an announcement you don't you don't share you announce an announcement you, de- you declare an mm. announcement mm. And, and so yeah it's it's i mean the, the word for preach or proclaim it is an announcement that demands compliance and so when you speak the good news it's not good advice as we all know it's good news and it's not just news it's good news and it, it demands a response at some level. It doesn't mean you have to stand up in a classic pulpit and do it only, though you wouldn't be bad if we did that. But I mean, okay, say you're at a coffee shop with a friend and you're doing a sort of like a seeker Bible study, let's just say, or just a conversation. And, and you just think, hey, this is a great segue into talking about the gospel. You, can, you have two different roads you can take. You can explain the gospel and then you can preface it or conclude it by saying, well, you know, that's just, that's just what I believe, or that's just what Christians believe. You know what? That's really disingenuous because whether you believe it or not, or whether that's just what Christians believe, it's, it's the truth regardless. And so you, you need to be able to say it in a way that presses the issue upon them 
and and speak it in a way that is truthful and not just you know evasive and avoiding where well you're you're a buddhist or you're a muslim and that's what you believe i'm a christian that's what i believe well that's very relativistic it's the truth and it should be spoken and proclaimed as such and so you know you need to lean forward you can explain the gospel and you're teaching it but then when you lean forward and say and unless you repent and trust in christ Mm -hmm. you likewise will undergo the judgment of god but we live in a season of amnesty and the king has has declared amnesty for anybody who would bow the knee and trust in christ Amen to that. How how did uh, just a quick follow up question to that, if if that's okay for me to hop in? Yeah. How did Adoniram Judson specifically uh, operate in that vein? Because I, I think it's easier for us to wrap our minds around that. But when it comes time to do cross cultural ministry, we're thinking, oh well, I'm coming into a new culture. I'm a learner. I'm not ready to be that strong and abrasive. Uh, if, if we do consider that to be abrasive, it, it just is what the gospel is. How, how did Adoniram Judson do that? Well, he, he spent the first couple of years reading copiously everything. Like when I, when I did my PhD, my PhD supervisor, I asked him, what do I need to do to get ready for my dissertation? He said, read everything. And he meant it <laughs> like everything. And so I did. And Judson did similarly. He read everything in literature Grammatically, historically, about about Burma, about Buddhism, and um, he just jumped right in and immersed himself as best as he could. And he had friends from the very beginning where he would ask questions, he would study their culture, their ideas, and he uh, he he limited a lot of his ministry um, emphasis to language learning on the front end, so that he was um, well qualified to to have good discussions with them later on. And then a lot of his, his uh, evangelism revolved around the way they would do things in their religious order. So the monks would, the monks would sit on the, essentially on the side of the highway and they would, they would preach to passersby. So Judson was like a classic street preacher because he learned it from the monks Mm -hmm. go do what they did in a way that corresponded to how they understood a man of God or religious man would communicate information. And so he, uh, he jumped right in and he just, he just imitated how they would communicate information from a religious man's perspective. Well, this is interesting because it is very contextualized. And so you, so what you're saying isn't that we shouldn't contextualize or understand the culture or, or build relationships. Cause I do think sometimes there's a little bit of like, I'm just going to show up somewhere and just mm-hmm. say, Jesus is Lord repent without even taking into account they don't know who Jesus is. They don't know what you mean by Lord yeah. and they don't understand what repentance might look like, you know? Uh, and, and you're, you're showing us that, that those two can go together, that there yeah. is, there was intense preparation. There was not, not just building a relationship and, and just being soft, but, but taking the time to understand what were the questions and what was the, what was the best way for this to message to be potentially received. Am I catching you right? Yeah. So he, I mean, I, okay, just autobiographically speaking, when I was in one cu- country before Southeast Asia and I was learning the language and I was just, I was trying to be an observer of how people authoritatively communicated things, with, whether it was a segment on the news, whether mm. it was sitcom, whether it was the way people talk at the stop or just the way, a, you know, husband mm. and wife talk to each other or the principal at the school I was teaching at. And so I just observed, 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 and just watched. And then as I worked on language, I'd ask questions like, like this, you know, if, if I were to, if let's say I was a doctor and if I were to communicate a diagnosis to a patient that they needed to understand the, the gravity and the weightiness of this particular diagnosis, how would a doctor speak? And, you know, my language teacher would explain it. And then I, I kind of, use that. I adapted that into a gospel presentation. Um, and so as I, as I studied the way they would communicate things, I, I tried to think of how do you communicate the gravity and the goodness of the gospel in this particular culture. And it, and it ended up working really well. But um, a lot of these conversations I had, you know, you can't have the same sort of gospel conversation with everybody. Guy in the taxi or your, your buddy that you're going out to have and, you know, lamb kebabs with uh the 
quality of conversation and the length of conversation is just going to be unique depending on the, on the person. Okay. I don't want to go down this road anymore because Alex, this is a whole, we could do a whole nother episode and I hope we get the opportunity to do another episode just mm-hmm. on that. <laughs> Cause that was really, yeah. help, really, really good and really helpful. So I'm, yes, I'm going to, I'm going to quickly transition us off of that. Cause I want to save that for later. If you'll be so kind to allow us to, come back to that in another episode but uh i'll allow it not you alex uh, ed oh, <laughs> oh, oh. <laughs> um so taking it a little different direction so what what place then should apologetics have in a word-driven ministry because sometimes we think of like apologetics as pre-evangelism or or laying a foundation for to be to hearing the word and and you talk about uh in in the book um, Adoniram and Anne using apologetics and even writing a very effective gospel tract uh, comparing uh, Buddhism and Christianity. Um, but w- what place should that have in a word driven ministry? And how, how effective was that um, in, in the Judson's ministry? Well, the Judson's viewed, I mean, in, in a way they were kind of like presuppositional apologists um, mm-hmm. so for anybody who's not familiar that essentially that, places all the weight and the sufficiency and the efficacy of the word of God. And so you, in other words, you don't want to go to say the Buddhist side of life and argue from their perspective to Christianity. You want to keep bringing people back to the word. And so the Judson's, I mean, essentially they believed in the, the power of the seed, the seed is the word and um, all of the, the life and the powers in the seed. And so you just, you cast it and disseminate it indiscriminately. You just throw it and chuck it as much as you can and let God be God and let the soils be the soils. And so yeah. when it came to apologetics, Judson would um, argue from the written word, from the text, and he'd show the, the Buddhists, you know, where it was written. They would talk about it and compare and contrast Buddhism and Christianity. Judson wasn't afraid to go there. Of course, he did it. He did it respectfully. Um, he, you know, he even dressed in the, the orange golden robes that they would dress in. I mean, he tried to be as, he tried to get over all the hurdles as much as possible. And it came to speaking in a way and in a manner that they would appreciate. But, um, he was always bringing the conversation back to the word. And there was one guy he was talking to at one point who said, you know, um, this all makes sense. I, I understand essentially he was tipping his uh, hat, his proverbial hat to the, the reasonableness of the cross at one point. And Judson Hmm. basically says to him, well, it's, it's one thing to affirm the reasonableness of my good news message, basically. But then he says, you have not yet yielded to the word. And he, he says, until you obey the word and repent and, and trust in this gospel, essentially. Um, Hmm. Yeah. I can't guarantee that you even believe the truth because you must yield to the word. And, and it, that was, that was the litmus test of even whether or not somebody should be baptized was they might be willing to suffer for Christ, but mm. until they are ready to obey the word and, and, um, and get baptized uh, publicly, Judson was, was, um, he was a little bit hesitant to usher somebody into the church so quickly as a, as a good dirty Baptist would be <laughs> right. <laughs> um, by the way, note to self, uh, start a podcast called the dirty Baptists. But anyway, I, I think that's critical because I think that if we started gauging conversion in that way, we would probably start counting metrics on the mission field a lot differently. Um, as you've served with missionaries, uh, shoulder to shoulder in Asia, um, specifically thinking in this Buddhist context. So you bring up apologetic methodology. You don't want to argue, you know, a bridge from Buddhism, for instance, into Christianity. And that's going to be pretty difficult to do because that's an atheistic uh, philosophy or, or worldview, right? So what, what were some of the unique challenges of that because of Buddhism's you know, atheistic uh, presupposition there? Or was it not a challenge because he was just operating out of scripture and just proclaiming there is one God? Well, so, I mean, the, the providence of God is mysterious in what God uses. And it's, it's amazing how some people are primed and ready by the Holy Spirit to just take the gospel and others. It's just, it's like hard, rocky soil. And so the way it happened, it seemed with Judson was, um, he got busy translating and proclaiming the word. So 
just briefly, he was a preacher at heart. He was offered the most prestigious pulpit in New England before he went to the mission field, and he turned it down out of Mm. a calling, out of a burden from the Great Commission to go to the unreached. And as he's, I mean, he he had such a dynamic preaching gift, just an orator's um, dream come true, and he turned it down. And he goes to the mission field, hmm. and uh, he he would write in his diaries. And I'm gonna I'm gonna come come around to answer your question here in a second. But he would, he would write in his diaries how he longed to preach the word. He he wished he had a pulpit, but then he would pause and he'd say, "But they have no written text. So what am I going to preach?" And so what drove him as a translator was a desire to preach the word. And um, so hmm. he called it a great self denial to deny himself the privilege and the and the pleasure of preaching so that he could translate the word. And so when he, um, he comes around finally to, to share the word, he was, he, he had invested himself so much in this written word so that he started, as he started to suffer, the people wondered why he stayed and what, what broke through in this Buddhist worldview was they saw this man, this white man from, the Americas come over and suffer, watch his family suffer. He goes to prison. He gets tortured in prison. He's, he has, he has opportunities to leave. The British want him as a translator. Um, he, he has multiple opportunities to be a diplomat, to be somebody who's, who, who can escape the grind of living among the, the Burmese Buddhists. And he turns it all down for the sake of this translation project. And for the first time, in, in their memory, they see a religious man denying himself, not, not for the sake of denying himself pleasure, but for the sake out of loving his neighbor, because they knew that he was doing this for them. And there was something otherworldly about his self-denial that stood out to them. That was different than Buddhist self-denial. It was a self-denial out of love for people and out of a passion for truth. And so when when it came around to it, people would come from all over the known Asian region and they would ask, Are, we hear you're the Jesus Christ man. You're the man who has a writing that tells us how of, a, of an eternal heaven, how to escape an eternal hell. Please give us this writing because they knew the wow. legends and the lore about this man who suffered and stayed was, was um, you know, heroic. He was legendary. He was, in a, in a sense, he was kind of like a folk hero um, to these people. Wow. You know, that does remind me, if I can just hop in real quick here again, a story I heard uh, recently about Wayne Chen, who Wayne Chen is someone who's with our um, friend of the show, Radius International. Um, and Wayne, uh, his wife is in the midst of a, a cancer battle, um, but uh, they were ministering to a people group. Uh, I'm forgetting the name of the people group right now. Um, but one thing that they needed to do was uh, when she was first diagnosed, um, she needed to stay in Taiwan for treatment. And she encouraged Wayne to go back uh, into the country uh, without her uh, if if he had to. Um, and at one point, one of the tribesmen that they were trying to reach made the comment, hey, whatever message you're getting ready to share with us, it better it must must be important because we see that you're you're coming back even with cancer doing this. And that speaks to exactly what you're saying is, is that the, the suffering of someone's life and their, their commitment to getting that message out through translation, through years of translation work, you know, we're just not wired to think that way, right? We think in terms of how can we have a multiplied impact in the shortest term commitment as possible. And, and yet the staying power then is in, in translating it so that there's a written word so that endures and that people see and they start to pay attention and listen and realize, wow, whatever this is that people are spending their lives on, wasting their lives on um, is obviously of eternal importance. Just anecdotally, he had a conversation with a, a Buddhist monk and just just briefly, he, this Buddhist monk said, wow, this is a very hard teaching. Um, basically knowing he's being convicted and he's, he's, he's saying, this is, this is a game changer. This is going to change everything. I'm going to lose it all. I'm going to lose my family, my status, my job, my reputation, maybe even my own life. And Judson's retort was, well, yeah, I have left everything. I have lost everything because there truly is an eternal heaven and an eternal hell. And 
this book has the words of life. And he said, yeah, I, why would I risk losing all of, all of this, all of my privileged status in the United States to come just to mm. a book of literature? This is beyond literature. This is the word, the lamp from heaven, as he would call it. It was a good contextualized analogy. So yes, um, yes and amen to what you said about the staying power of, of remaining with the people in spite of the suffering. We, we tend to think, cause, I mean, we, you know, I live in, in California and, uh, you know, obviously there's tons of people from all over the world and lots of different religions and backgrounds. And, and we, we can, we can sometimes tend to think that, that they, that their spirituality is based on some kind of similar type relationship. I, I know, I know we don't ever would ever say that, like that they would know God, but we kind of assume that the same inner spiritual life that we are trying to experience and that our experience thing is going on over there too. And, and hmm. yet um, it's so important that we really understand that we have to develop our relationship with God and that, that when we are walking with the Lord and in communion with him, as you're pointing out with, with Ann and Adoniram Judson and their deep walk with the Lord and their deep communion with God, that that actually stands out as something very compelling to a world that doesn't know God and, and doesn't have that spiritual life. And, uh, it, you know, that, that, that's what's lacking. And when they meet us and see that while, while you know, God and our community have a communion with God, um, th that is compelling and, and is a, is also an apologetic, uh, of, I guess we can say, yeah. um, you, you talk a lot about how, how Judson, deeply focused on his ongoing relationship with the Lord. Do you feel like that's something that missionaries neglect today? Yes and no. I mean, I think we live in a day of, of distractions. Distractions dominate us. I mean, missionaries struggle with the same smartphone distractions everybody else does in the world. Um, it's just the tyranny of the busy and the distraction is, is everywhere. And so, yes, I, I think missionary struggle. But more than that, I, I do think that there is a, uh, a general piety among missionaries that's unique. Um, they are there, they need, they need sustenance, they need an otherworldly staying power, and they know that. But I think what's the problem is, is not so much in lack of, of spirituality and lack of piety among missionaries. I think the problem is, is a lack of word-centered spirituality. So um, people, and this is, you know, just observation, they, if they get burned out or they feel like they're just frazzled and on the fray, they, they do, you know, conferences or retreats where a lot of the emphasis is on listening for some cryptic word from the Lord, because in, in, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. in experience, what got them to the mission field may have been some sort of, um, inner impressions, some, maybe, a, maybe even they'll talk about a dream or some, some, you know, they'll even talk about a prophetic word or something that a, a Jesus calling sort of experience that they, they are just compelled based upon some existential experience. And then when they hit the skids on the mission field, well, like I said earlier, what you mobilize them with is what you mobilize them to. They'll go back to those experiential highs you know, they go to the the high powered worship service to get to get kind of an emotional jolt just to, just to press on another week. And I can't fault them because I've been in their shoes and I've done the same thing. But as you, you begin to see people fade away when they realize you just can't keep manufacturing those experiences, you hit, there's got to be something more stable. You know, you, you have to have something objective outside of you, external to you, the external word, as Luther called it. Um, you need mm -hmm. something to stand on that's, that's immutable. And that's, that's where the written word comes in is um, we have to ground our spirituality in an ancient gospel. And if I can be so bold as to say, but also a, a community committed to the written word. Um, yeah. Yeah. Because absolutely. I do think that there could be a tendency in us to just be kind of do it alone. I mean, there's that rugged individualism that still, you know, resides in our American genes, you know? Uh, and I'm, I'm realizing that sometimes when people are going to like these conferences, 
there there is actually an impulse there that is good and that is that the the deeply ingrained need in us to find community um and that, that i think the scriptures talk about all the time but the problem is often it's not like a word based church local church based uh type of community it's you know this experiential um kind of thing or even it can even be a preaching conference but not in people you're covenant relationship with and they don't know you and they just you know just get pumped up so i would i would love to you know just add to that like we need to be in a community of people that are covenanted together around the word and church um to challenge us that in that way too so when we are struggling individually we have uh, that support. And that's critical for a missionary because a missionary is to be a church planter. It, absolutely. And so, you know, you don't want to go out as a lone ranger and a lone wolf, but the fact of the matter, and this is just an obvious statement, is they're there because there's no Christians or there's very few Christians. And so it's very possible that there is no true church community. And so their church community is their team, you know, a team of two or three units. And uh, so all the more, you're right, the word has to be central. And that team, a lot of times, I mean, the camaraderie and the joy that a missionary can experience in a tight-knit team, I mean, it's, 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 a, it's amazing. It's beautiful what, what sort of community missionaries have. And, and that's why when they come back from the field and they join a, a local church, they, they feel so dry, yeah. mm. so, yeah. so, like, empty because – there's something about the the tenacity of a team on mission and just, hey, we're going to stick in this together. And then when they leave that, the camaraderie and the koinonia that they had overseas um, is is unlike anything they can ever find again in the United States or, or country. And it's it's a lot like, I mean, talking to military friends who leave, leave uh, their posts or leave their assignments and they come back and they come back to civilian life they miss it because they miss the camaraderie and the community of being on mission together. And, and just that sense of we got each other's back that they've never been able to find again back in civilian life. And it's very similar in a different way for missionaries. Um, yeah. So the word must ground that community. And if you have that on a team, man, you, God, God does amazing things through those kinds of teams. And I've seen it over and over again. Mm. That's encouraging. You so often hear about the negative side of, of team conflict, but nothing can unite and encourage and knit together the hearts of a team quite like scripture, the, the written word. And it's not just the written word, but it's the written word that points to the living word, the the person of Christ, the, the word uh, made flesh. And uh, what an important reminder, you know, it's communion with God, um, not just in this vague ethereal sense, but it's communion with the person of God through his written word. Uh, that's what we need. We need word driven missionaries and ED uh, really think that you have some important wisdom here. So how can people get more of that through your writing and how can they follow you in your ministry? Well, uh, so the book is the missionary theologian and that um, came out this last July. I've got two more coming out next year. If the Lord wills uh, with founders press, I just actually went ahead and signed the contract this week. So those be looking for those. Um, I have a landing page if people want to just kind of see some of the things I've written. It's just eburns.net, um, eburns.net. And um, I direct the Frontier Gospel Project, which is, uh, it's, it's on there. You can, you can look at what that is and what that does. Um, but yeah, I, uh, I'd be happy to hear from anyone who wants to contact me through that. Um, yeah, very very thrilled to be on with you guys. Thanks so much for your ministry. And uh, yeah, this, this was a great conversation. Well, we want to have you back on and go deeper on that topic. So thank you so much for joining yeah, us. That's good. Yeah. To get more content, go to missionspodcast.com or check out abwe.org slash podcast. If you like what you hear, please subscribe, rate, review, and share. To ask a question or suggest a topic, email alex at missionspodcast.com, and we'll see you next time on the Missions Podcast.